Good morning, everyone. Hymn number 358. Let's get started this morning. There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while his ransom ones we see. Marching on, marching on, for Christ got everything but lost, and to crown him. The standard be displayed, and they need this fold as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ had everything but lost, and to crown him king, full and sing, beat the banner of the cross. Glory draws his drawing very near, it is hastening day by day. Then before our king the post shall disappear, and the cross the world shall sway. Marching on, marching on, for Christ got everything but lost, and to crown him. I'd like to read two, uh, two passages of scripture for the theme of this uh, devotion and then just a couple comments. Uh, the first one is in Matthew 9, 9 through 13, and then I want to read Luke 15, 1 through 7. Matthew 9, 9 through 13, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, Behold, many publicans, or tax collectors, and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold thee not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." And then a similar passage in Luke 15, 1 through 7, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath find it, found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Yesterday I was uh, with my brother. We were up in Deerfield, Illinois, uh, Alida and my sister-in-law, uh, a family member was having a baby shower. So they were there, so my brother and I had time to kill. So I asked him, I said, you wanna go have lunch? I'll buy you lunch. So we went and had lunch and we were driving and we thought, well, we'd hit a couple of state sales and there was two uh, Orthodox Jews walking down the street and they had everything on like they would. And uh, I asked my brother, I said, wow, I didn't know there was Orthodox Jews live up here in Deerfield. There's a number, a large number of Jewish population, but not Orthodox. He said, well, they don't. And he's not from there, Deerfield, but he was familiar with it. He said, uh, they come to proselytize. And I said, really? And he said, I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, he used to work in Highland Park, which is a very high uh, Jewish population. 
And they would come into the store and they would ask if anyone was Jewish, that they would try to, the Orthodox would try to proselytize my guess is maybe nominal Jews more to their, uh, to what they believe is correct. And uh, so I thought about that, and I thought, well, how about the people who aren't Jews? Aren't the, wasn't the nation of Israel supposed to be a light unto all the world? I had a lot of experience uh, dealing with, uh, well, I thought a lot of experience. In my job, when I, when I delivered with Coke, I had a machine route, and I would go everywhere. And uh, I had a lot of them in the Orthodox community. They're mostly uh, centered in Rogers Park in Chicago. And uh, I would go and they have their own schools. Uh, they have their own high school. Erie Crown was a big high school. Uh, they have their own little synagogues that have the uh, schools in there. Uh, they're very, you know, inclusive. And so I would go in there, a lot of these. I'd go there where they would be, uh, a lot of the men would be studying and praying. And uh, my own experience was they were very aloof. They weren't very approachable, friendly. If you engaged one and they're forced to, then they might say something, but they're really just standoffish. And I don't say that, you know, if you did engage them, they would be friendly, but they were just real aloof. I say all that because uh, the passage I just read, uh, these Pharisees saw Jesus with tax collectors who were despised, and he saw them with sinners, people who were considered sinners. They were sinners. We're all sinners. And uh, they derided the Lord for that. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, they were very unapproachable, the Jewish people in that day, especially these rabbis. Here was a man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who was very approachable. I believe Jesus is the most approachable person that ever walked this earth. It said that he received tax collectors and sinners. He was accused by his enemies in Matthew 11 and Luke 7. I won't read it, but he was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners. And I wonder uh, how often we're guilty of that too. You know, uh, Paul mentioned something. I really enjoyed Paul's uh, Bible study Wednesday, and he mentioned something about Jeff. Jeff had all kinds of friends. He had friends from the goth community, so to speak. And that lodged in my mind. I started thinking, I said, you know what? That's the way really all, we all should be. We should be ready to engage anyone and be friendly with anyone. Now, these rabbis weren't really friendly except to their own. Jesus one day told his disciples, you know what? We've got to go to Samaria. We must needs go to Samaria. And when the disciples left to get food, Jesus sat down at a well, and you all know the story, a very rough woman, in my, in my thinking and opinion, a, a woman with the exterior probably of a, of a rhinoceros, uh, came in there, and I think it had, not, it had been anyone else, I believe no conversation would have happened. If that would have been a Jewish rabbi, he would have never talked to her, and she would have never said anything either. But Jesus asked her a question. He said, give me the drink. And she said, who are you being a Jew would ask me, a Samaritan, to give you a drink? And that started the conversation. And she came to know the Lord. Sometimes I think we as Christians are guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. It takes time to invest in people's lives. I was talking to uh, a man last night. Um, he'll be nameless, but he's a Puerto Rican man, and he was asked to go visit uh, a man they thought was Puerto Rican who is, uh, has cancer. They don't know how long he'll live and everything. Turns out he's Chinese. The man was uh, uh, raised in uh, Costa Rica, I believe it was, Costa Rica, and uh, nothing in common. The man doesn't know the Lord. But for some reason, I'm sorry, excuse me. Some reason the Lord wanted this Puerto Rican man. And this Chinese man has a liking to him and his wife, and he wants to talk to them. And I was talking to the, the Puerto Rican man last night, and he said he tried to present the gospel to him a couple times, and the man was firm. He thinks everything's fine. He says, I realize this is going to be a relationship. 
that I have to become his friend. It's okay for us as Christians to have friends. Jesus had, he was friends of all different people. And that doesn't mean we do what things that aren't right. We set up our own boundaries. But Jesus said, Mark, go you into all the world. Where to go and engage. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we are in our own little schools, we're in this and that, and we kind of become like a lot of the Hasidic Jews do. They're very to themselves. And uh, just as Israel was to be a light of the world, uh, whether they wanted to be or not, the Lord made them a light of the world. And I think of with Naaman, that little, that little maiden girl who was... Uh, uh, captured in one of the raids, and now she was really a captive, a servant of Naaman, that, that uh, uh, head of the army of Syria. But yet, look at the, the love she had for that man when he had leprosy. He just said, would God, the, the God of Israel, uh, the prophet of Israel, could heal you of these things? And she pointed him to the Lord. We need to be more friendly and open with people. And I'm sure everyone is here. Sometimes I'm not, and I need to be. I have friends who uh, uh, don't know the Lord. Uh, do I try to, and, and I, I love to have coffee or, or dinner, everything. do I try to constantly witness to them? No, I don't try to constantly witness to them. If the Lord ar a need arises, I pray before. I have long-term relationships, but regardless, that should be our motive. We should engage people for, as friendship because we want to win them to the Lord. We ask questions. We learn about their lives. Uh, you know, we, we, we set down tracks. Uh, we'll never see those people again. We don't know sometimes who's going to pick them up. The Lord knows. But normally behind all that, there is a relationship somewhere. I picked up a track when I was in the service, and that's where the Lord really closed the deal, so to speak, and brought me to him. But it's easy for me to forget that there was a young Marine in there. I can't remember his name exactly. But I remember he was approachable to me. And I remember asking him questions about the Bible. And he might not have been a Bible scholar or anything, but he gave me answers that satisfied me. And there was a relationship. And uh, Jesus was the most approachable person. He said, come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden. We can come to Jesus because he is a friend of sinners and publicans, and we are sinners who have been saved by the grace of, the, of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, but we come to him because people think they cannot approach God and on their own they cannot, but the God-man, Jesus Christ, says, come unto me. And that's what I wanted to share. So may we all uh, here uh, engage in relationships with people just like Jeff did. You know, Jeff was doing it right there. And we need to do the same. And there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's my, my devotion. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for engaging us. Thank you, Lord, for being so approachable. Thank you, Lord, for even when they tried to withhold little children from you, you said, allow them to come unto you. I thank you, Lord, that you didn't turn us away when we came to you as poor, broken sinners in need of you, Thank you, Lord, for forgiving us our sins. And as you have sent us out in the world to, to follow and to you to live through us, help us, Lord, to be a friend to those in the world. Even though they may differ with us and they may be completely different or whatever the case, Lord, help us to simply love them and to learn more about them and to present you when you open the door. Please be with all the teachers now as they minister to us and teach. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We are beginning in 1 John chapter 4 in verse number 3.
First John chapter number four. Verse number three. First off, good morning. How are you this morning? Everybody doing great? The weather's been good. In fact, this week at church camp was awesome. It wasn't super hot. It was just beautiful all week. Normally it's scorching hot. People are looking for, for water fountains and cool air. And, you know, this year we didn't have to run the kids out of the, uh, uh, the, the cafeteria like we have in the past. We still had to run them out, but not like we did in the past because it was nice out. But God supplied a beautiful week for us. And there were some souls that got saved at church camp. Here at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3. Uh, yeah, begin at verse 3. It says, In every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. In the devotional this morning, John brought up there's some Jewish people that why is he eating with sinners? He can't be of God. Why would he? He wouldn't be doing that. Well, they didn't know God very well, did they? Well, Jesus came in the flesh, and it was prophesied he was going to come in the flesh, all the way in Genesis when sin first entered in. So, if people that if you don't confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you are not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Turn with me to Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. Begin at verse 1, it says, Now I say that the heir, and you know what an heir is, right? You ever seen a king and queen that has a son, and he would be heir to the throne? In other words, when that king is gone, he would be the next in line. Now I say that the heir, as long as, the, as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That means that before we come to know Jesus Christ, we were God was not our Father. We were under bondage of the world. We were headed down the same path of sin which would lead us directly to hell of which we all deserve. Verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons of God, uh, sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them by nature, which are no gods. Before you were Christ, before you were saved, you did by nature the things that you do. And you all know, as well as I know, that there is a nature in me that's constant division with, with the Spirit of God. But I know I am, I am of God because I know that division is there. Everyone, if you do not know or believe, if, if G, uh, say it this way, if you are not a saved child of God, you don't have the knowledge of God in you, you're going to burn in hell forever. But if you're a saved child of God, you know it. You know you'll never lose it because you know you didn't do anything to gain it. You know that Jesus Christ did it all. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was uh, beaten, nailed to a cross, died, buried, and rose again the third day that we might have eternal life. You have that knowledge, full assurance. 
Verse 4 tells us, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Ye are the saved, them are the lost. Because greater is he that is in you, and even a backslidden child of God knows that God, that he is saved, because God is in his heart. That is why a backslidden person will live in misery his entire life if he chooses his own way versus God's way and how he should live. But he says here, little children, you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5, which is one chapter over from our text. 1 John chapter number 5. Beginning at verse number 10. If we, if, ye, if we, we being the saved, receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness of in himself he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave his son and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in the son he that hath the son hath life he that hath not the son of God hath not life you may see works for salvation in that he works for, do you even see works for even keeping your salvation? Or works that you don't do that you can lose your salvation? Anybody see that? Nobody sees that, right? A lot of people should not teach that. But we have overcome the world because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. When we truly put our faith and trust in God and know that we have nothing to do with salvation, but we have everything to do with the separation from God, but we know that Jesus Christ had everything to do with bringing us back to God. Do you know you'll live a more peaceful and happy life knowing that you don't have to do anything to, to maintain salvation? You do have to maintain your walk with God, but does it maintain your salvation? In verse 4 it says, Ye are of God. I want to go back. In, I want to go, back go ahead. Verse 2 and 3, there's an important thing that I just want to make a point here. Uh, he said, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Now, why, why, why was so important to talk about, to make that statement? So, John's writing to this congregation. Why is it so important to bring that to light about Jesus coming in the flesh? I mean, what you stated, what you stated was about receiving Jesus, mm -hmm. and having Jesus in you. But I need, we need to back up and ask the question: Why did you make the statement that there are, are those the, the spirit of Antichrist, and he's driving home a point here about Jesus coming in the flesh? Why is that so important? You have to explain what you're talking about. I know it's important because because God, if, if Jesus didn't come physically, actually come, in other words, God himself come through his son, if that didn't happen, then we don't have no payment for sin. Okay. So you need to That's explain what, what you're, what you're talking about. Statement. But what we have to look at is that uh, Jesus declared that he was the son of man. Now, we also have to remember that that was a term that was very under, very well understood by the Jewish people uh, because fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy was that the Son of Man will come and Jesus took upon himself flesh and uh, walked on this earth 100% God but 100% man and the Jews knew who Jesus was but they rejected him and if you, uh, if you say that Jesus did not come as in the form of a man, it was necessary to come in the form of man. It was necessary in order to fulfill scripture. 
It was necessary that he was bruised for our, our iniquities. It was necessary that he was uh, broken on our, on our behalf on the cross of Calvary. If he did not come in the flesh, then we, as you stated it, we have no payment. But it would say that we would still be looking for whoever that Messiah is. Mm -hmm. And there are many that over the years have tried to uh, either either discount that Jesus was that individual in the flesh. Even after Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the grave, what did the, what did the priests do? They paid the soldiers to say that his body was taken. And therefore, that he could not have been the risen Savior. So my point is, is that this is critical to realize that Jesus did come in the flesh. If we reject that he came, and, and there's some that, there's some religions that teach that Jesus, that the Messiah did not come physically, he came metaphorically. <coughs> well, no, with metaphorically doesn't get you on the cross. All right, so that's what I'm saying is that we have, when, when we talk about receiving Christ the Savior and receiving the penalty, the payment for our sin, that requires him to have come in the flesh died in the flesh, died as, a, a, as the, the Messiah, the Christ, and pay our sin debt. And if anyone says that he didn't come, or they don't believe that he was here because they haven't seen him, is they're rejecting the fact that he did come. You know, I believe that George Washington walked this earth. I've never seen him, but I believe that he did. Well, I believe that Abraham Lincoln was a president of this country. I never saw him, but I believe that he was. But he was here in the flesh. My point is, is that we have to be willing to look at the historical documents. One of those is the Bible. And there's other secular writings that talk about Jesus being here. If we don't put him in the flesh, we don't have a Savior. Because he did not die. If he wasn't here, he did not die. He, did not, he was not buried, and he didn't rise again. So anyone that says that he wasn't the one, and anyone rejects that Jesus in the flesh was the Son of God, they have rejected him in the flesh. And that's what I'm that's what I'm saying is that we can't we have to look at what what, what John is saying here, because without this being true, you and I could never possess him in our hearts. We could never have him as our Savior if this is not true. And if we don't accept it, then we're nothing more than the Antichrist ourselves. We have the spirit of Antichrist within us. You ever heard of, a, in Jerusalem, a place called the Wailing Wall? Everybody's ever heard of that, the Wailing Wall? Well, if you look in, our, our media sometimes shows it. And there's the wall, it's one of the walls of, of I believe it was, uh, wall, was it the wall of the temple? About all that's left. It's about all that's left, that one wall, and it's a sacred wall. And you see guys standing there at the wall with their hands on it, and they're bowing and they're praying. What they're praying for is for Messiah to come because they didn't accept the first Jesus. And they're still praying for him, but he already did come. Well, that is that is Satan himself telling the world and showing the world that that there are people still waiting for Jesus is which puts mass confusion into people. The word of God from Genesis, I will put enmity to the law. And in the law, they killed animals, killed animals, killed animals. Picturing what Jesus would do, the death of the innocent. And then Jesus came and the Jewish people were looking for a king because even in the Old Testament, they told God, give us a king, give us a king, give us a king. And they thought that God was going to send them this conquering king instead of this Jesus. And they didn't accept Jesus. Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. He put them in their place time after time after time. And they still would not accept Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead. And the priest knew that Jesus rose from the dead because they had to tell, they had to make up this lie that his body was stolen. 
They had to make up lies about him to even get him crucified because they wouldn't, even though, they, even though this was Jesus, they could not believe this was Jesus. When Jesus rose from the grave, how many people was he seen by? It, how many people seen him die? You can't, you don't know the number, but it was multitudes of people that seen him die. And he was pronounced dead by who? Roman soldiers. Pronounced. He's dead. He is dead. And they know when a man is dead. Jesus was dead. And then on the third day, he was put behind a, behind the stone that, that a man himself couldn't physically move. And then on the third day he rose, the, the, the soldiers that were sleeping there, soldiers didn't do that. When they had an important task, such as they were tasked with, they don't just fall asleep. That don't happen. These guys were trained soldiers. Well, they were as dead men, I think the scripture says. And the stone was rolled away. Jesus came out. He was seen after he had risen about by how many people? Above 500? Doesn't the scripture say 500? He physically showed the nail scars in his hands. And then he said, blessed are them that believe and have not seen. Jesus came in the flesh. You and I believe that Jesus came in the flesh like it. Brother Hal said, we believe George Washington was here, but we've never physically seen him, but we know he was here. We can even go back to all the presidents that were born and died before we ever were ever thought of. Is, is, was, there, was there any in Egypt? Was there any pyramids built in Egypt? How many years ago were they built? Many, many. We, we've never physically seen it, but we know they're there. We've seen them pictures of them. We've seen, I mean, there's people that have seen them. Those are possibly built by God's Jewish people in slavery. Jesus came. They say that, uh, that was part of my, my lesson, but they say that when the children of Israel, when God called them out, and when they, where they crossed the Dead Sea, where they tried to find where they crossed it, they said there are artifacts of chariots at the bottom of that sea that are strode across from one side to the other where they crossed it in this deep sea. Why are they there? Because that's where they crossed. I mean, there's just Noah's Ark. Mount Ararat has never in the span of life since the flood Ararat, Mount Ararat has never seen enough water to put a boat that big there. Why would a boat that big be there? And it was there. That ark was there on Mount Ararat, parts of it. It was found. Why? Because Noah built a boat to the specs that God said, and the world was destroyed in the flood. All the artifacts that are found beneath the earth that people are saying are millions of years old, that all happened because of a cat catastrophe of a flood. Was there dinosaurs? Yeah, but they died in the flood. They died in the flood. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now I'm going to tell you this. Every single person that has come to the knowledge that has reached that age of accountability has been convicted by the Holy Spirit. Every single person. Not one person that lives, that reaches the age of accountability is not convicted by God himself, by the Holy Spirit. Everyone. That's why we're here today. Because we have that conviction. In our text, in verse 4, Ye are of God, us that believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, died, crucified, and rose again, and paid our sin debt. Ye are of God. In verse 5, They, those that choose not to believe, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. 
I hear this all the time in today's society. Preachers say it. Uh, teachers say it. Everyone say it in today's society because when you look at society, you have to say that in today's society, churches are getting smaller. I'm talking about true churches getting smaller and the world's system is getting bigger and growing and growing. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man also be. They are of the world, ye are of God. Verse John chapter 2, back up a couple of chapters from where you're at, beginning at verse number 15. Love not the world. This morning in the devotional, Brother John brought out that we aren't to love people of the world. He brought up some people called goth people. We need to love the way, but we are to love those people. We're to go to those people. We are to witness those people. We are to befriend those people. Don't, don't do what they do, but befriend the people. So when it says love not the world, that's talking about the society, the world system. Don't love that, but love the person. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. They are of the world. They don't love God. They don't do the will of God. They will perish when the earth burns. And when they don't, when they refuse to accept Jesus because they will be convicted, they will spend eternity in hell. The world hears them. Turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. Beginning at verse number 63. John chapter 6 and verse 63. In the world, the world is death. Earth's going to melt. All those outside of God are going to burn in hell for all eternity. In verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth. In other words, the spirit makes you alive. We are spiritually dead until we accept Jesus. Then the spirit quickeneth, makes us alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my Father. Has anybody seen any work for salvation in that? Or works for maintaining salvation? I like to really throw those in there and add those in there. Because I, when I witness to people, I keep, I, it's the one thing I hear as to how you, they work to be saved, how good they are, and how they maintain their salvation. And what are the states there? Is it just because the Lord knows who is going to receive him and reject him before they ever do it mm -hmm. does not mean he's ever taken away their free will to actually receive him or reject him. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing something and uh, is one thing, but acting upon it is another. So it's just a, another, because a lot of times the Calvinists will say, well, see there, the Lord already knew he was going to receive and not receive. Well, no, he just says he knew. That is the omniscience of God. He's all knowing. That's how that's how smart God is. Yeah. Talked so, about that this week. He's smart. In other words, when you say when when it says here God knows, that doesn't mean they can't. They can be saved. He just knows that they're not going to. But they can. A Calvinistic way says they can't. And when you say that, now you have you have said that God can't save everyone. And that's not true. John chapter. 10, verse 3 and 4. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. 
Whenever a child of God does something that is wrong, does he know it? How does he know it? Convicting of the Holy Spirit. Convicting. That's what that verse means. They that he putteth forth his own sheep and go before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The voice of the Lord is indwelt within us. We hear his voice, and when we're doing something wrong, his voice is telling us that is wrong or that is right. Verse number 14. John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You ever heard the story of the sheep where the, where the one sheep left the 99? And the shepherd went out and got him. Brought him back because the shepherd knows his sheep. There are some sheep who belong to him who go astray. In the, in, the, in the teachings of the church, God says when you have that person where they won't hear and you go to two or three, go to church, they don't hear. And God said, put them out. I know my sheep. I will take care of them. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Beginning at verse 17. Matthew 7 and 17. <clears throat> Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, but a but fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in fire. Wherefore, by their fruits shall you know them. Have you ever walked up to somebody who you had never met in your life and by simple conversation know that they are a child of God? I did that, I did that at one of the places I went to. There was a, a, a security officer in there, and she was just the nicest person. I said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And she said, yes, I am. I'm like, you can just spot it. You just know who is and who ain't. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I just read from our text verse, We are of God, and he that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. This know also that in the last days perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and holy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having the form of godliness. I'm going to stop right there. You ever talk to somebody that had the form of godliness, but you just knew they were not a child of God? Having the form, and, and you only reason you knew that is because you know the Word of God itself. Because you are a true child of God and you know the Word. You've studied the Word. But there are people that have not studied the Word, but look good to the world. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. 
For of this sort are they which crept into houses and led captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. We are at our time limit. I want to pick up at verse number seven next week. Beloved, let us love. And I want to talk about love for a little bit next week. Anybody have any question or comment? If not, we will pick back up at 11 for some singing, some lifting up our song and praise, and then Brother Hal will come and he will preach to us, and then we'll be back at 3 this evening for another sermon. Thank you.